You're listening to the Inquisitive Rent Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of the Inquisitive Rent Podcast. I hope that you've all been doing well, and I'm so happy that you're back. If you're new to the podcast, we talk about philosophy, psychology, spirituality, lots of different issues and topics. So there's a bit of an eclectic mix of interviews on the podcast. But always let me know if you're interested in either appearing on the podcast or you may want to suggest a particular interview. Today, I'm quite happy to welcome to the show a pet psychic. Beth Lee Crowther, who's also known as Psychic Beth, is a professional animal communicator. She's a pet psychic, a pet medium, and she can bring through pets through the world of spirit. She's also a Reiki master, and she's appeared on several TV shows, but I suppose regularly on This Morning on ITV, and she is their pet psychic. She's also appeared on Martin and Roman Kemp's Sunday Best TV show. Love that show. Ireland AM Breakfast TV and the Cheap Seats TV show in Australia, where she's gained an excellent reputation for her psychic animal readings. And uh, she continues to make lots of TV and radio appearances. Beth has grown really popular from her weekly radio show, Psychic Beth's Spiritual Calling. Beth has been a guest on numerous radio shows, including Capital Breakfast with Roman Kemp and Sonny J, Heart Breakfast with Amanda Holden and Jamie Teekson, Talk Radio with Rob Reinder and Paul Ross, also featured in newspapers and magazines. And she has her own best-selling books, Everything You Need to Know to Become a Pet Psychic, and Life by Numbers, all available on Amazon. Beth also regularly teaches animal communication workshops, helping people to develop those skills to communicate with their own animals. And we're going to talk about her professional background today because it's very, very interesting. But she, Beth has done some extraordinary work and she's just lovely to talk to. You know, she's psychic medium, she's clairvoyant, she's a Reiki master. And her speciality, and I've talked about this before in other podcasts, that mediums often have some type of speciality. And for Beth, it's as a pet psychic. That's her speciality. Although she's a medium, she can connect, of course, with other people who've passed on. But she really is a specialist in communicating with your pet. She's amazing at it. Her focus has always been to, you know, make this accessible to others and have them enjoy it as well. But also you'll find that her main focus is to share, to share the information and to teach people how to do it themselves, which just warms my heart. So uh, I'm really excited to talk to Beth today. All the links, of course, will be in the show notes to contact her. And I will leave some information if you want to learn how to be a guest on her radio show. So I'm really excited to speak to Beth on the podcast today. Beth, thank you so much for joining me today. It's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Brilliant. So now I've got a few questions, but I just want to start out with the psychic part. How did you first come to know that you were psychic? Well, I didn't really know. I just thought that I was the same as everybody else. And I thought everybody was having the same experiences as me. And of course, when you get older, and you start to realize when you talk to people that they're not experiencing what you are experiencing with the psychic side of things. It led me into quite a lot of research to really find out what was going on for me. And also if other people were having the same experiences. I've always been very drawn to uh, I suppose, paranormal type things, you know, I've always wanted tarot cards at a very early age. And of course, when I was a teenager in the 80s, there wasn't really anywhere you could find out 
about spiritualism very easily. Of course, we didn't have the internet and there wasn't much about it on the television. Yeah, absolutely. As I got older and managed to read more books about it, I did a lot of research on the internet to really, you know, find out exactly what I was um, experiencing and what was happening. And things just led from one to another in a natural progression I'd got a saddlery business and I was helping people with their animals particularly their horses and selling saddlery to them and they kept coming with their problems about their horses and I'd say well I know it's not your saddle it's because your horse has got a bad back or it's because you need a vet to have a look at whatever it is is going on And it was because I could almost like hear that particular pet sort of talking to me. And as time went on, people started bringing in their photographs and word got around and people started calling me a pet psychic. (laughs) And so naturally, I just sort of ended up doing more of that than my saddlery and also started doing readings for people. And then I be interested in the law of attraction and manifestation, and I read the secret, and I started experimenting with that as well. Excellent. You froze up there just for a moment, but I got the bit about you studied the law of attraction and the secret. That was such a phenomenon when it came out, wasn't it? Um, it yes, it and blew up everywhere. Mm. It seemed to be too good to be true that you could put your positive thoughts out to the universe and you would get back what you was hoping for. And I quickly learned that it wasn't really about objects, you know, like you want a new car or you want to win the lottery. It was more about aligning you with your soul's purpose, about who you really are. And if you really focus on that, that's what it will deliver to you and often through a series of synchronicities and I tested out the theory because I thought you know people are going to struggle thinking that somebody can be a pet psychic you know and they can look at your animal's picture and tell you what's going on inside your animal's head and how they feel and what's happened to them and so I asked the universe for an opportunity to share what I do with other people and I thought to myself wouldn't it be great if I could go on the radio and people could ring in and tell me oh I've got a dog called Jasper and you know those kind of things and I could tell them all about their dog and what was going on and I thought then they would know it's real because they would know that I don't know them they'd rung a radio show and I'm just picking up those thoughts and then people could listen in and ring in themselves and so I thought I'm going to try the law of attraction and ask to go on the radio and literally within two two weeks I parked my car in a road that I don't normally park in and unbeknown to me I parked outside a DJ's house from a local radio station and he'd seen a little sign in my window about my pet work And he phoned me and he invited me on to his radio show. And this all happened, Shah, within two weeks of me putting out that request to the universe. And when I went on the show, the phone lines were absolutely flooded. Everybody wanted to know what their pet was thinking. And that led me to having my own radio show on that station for five years. So I know that it it can really work. And then um, this would have been in about 2005, 2006. It was quite a long time ago. And then more recently, uh, probably about three or four years ago, I started thinking about that story when I put those thoughts out. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try it again. And I wrote a book called Life by Numbers, and I thought I'm going to try and ask the universe if it can become a number one Amazon bestseller, because that was a dream, you know, it happened again. So I thought, well, this is a 
bit more than coincidence. And then I said to the universe, if you could get me on TV, I could show everybody that animals can communicate through telepathy and a psychic link. So I asked the universe again. And the next thing that happened, a newspaper reporter got in touch with me and asked me, had I got any good pet communication stories that they might be interested in? And I remembered a story when when I tuned into one of my client's horses that also showed me that she was going to embark upon a new romance and she was desperate to find a new partner. And her horse was able to share with me through this psychic link who this person uh, would look like. And the most important thing was that he showed me that she knew he would be the one when she found that he had a big scar on his leg. He would be a sailor. He would be tall with dark hair. And all this came true. So I told the newspaper reporter about this story and they said, wow, that's amazing. Can we talk to Caroline, the lady you did the reading with and, and ask her about her horse, Fred, and, and, you know, get this story validated? And so I said, yes, I'm sure she won't mind. The next thing that happened, they wanted to come and make a video about this, about me and Caroline, the horse, Fred, and her partner. And that of into all the newspapers in the UK it was big news at the time and I remember the universe to get me on the telly not to get me in the paper so that I could share and demonstrate to everybody that, that animals can talk and communicate and the next two days was amazing because this morning on ITV then saw all this exposure in the newspaper and invited myself um and Caroline to do a live link with the horse Fred and her partner at the time, Charlie. And we were live on this morning on ITV. And it was so exciting. And then they asked me if I would stay on and do their phone in at 11.20 and that their viewers could send in photographs. So of course, as you can imagine, I was quite stressed about it, but I knew I'd asked for that. I'd asked the universe to give me that chance. So I knew I had to. Comfort zone and I knew I just got to go for it. Yeah. Fortunately, Shah, it went very nice as their pet psychic on their show. Yeah. And, and I know that you have been their pet psychic consultant, really. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. It's crazy. What a story. What a wonderful example of how the law of attraction works yes. and also how you use it, not just for yourself, but to help other people. That seemed to be your goal, really. How can I help other people? That's what you asked for. You didn't say it make was. Them famous. Yeah, you said, how can I get, let people know? So TV, radio, and I think that's the key to law of attraction. Mm. Me too, because I believe if you're in service to other people um, and you're very well-meaning and kind, I mean, what my real aim is to prove to people it works and how that can help themselves and also their pets mm -hmm. at the same time. And, and what really became amazing is how much your pets know about you and how much they can look at your past, your present, and even your future. So that's why I call it the pet psychic, um, because animals can also make these amazing predictions. And that's really helped an awful lot of people, particularly. Oh, I lost you there. Uh, no, there. Well, you froze just there. You, you were saying particularly, uh, oh, bear with me, bear with In us. their life, or they've been going through a hard trip. Particularly when they've been at a cross. 
Okay. No, um, particularly no, when they've been at a crossroads in their life. Right. Because people can often be at a point in their life where they feel stuck, they feel confused, they don't know which way to turn. And having a pet psychic reading can also assist them in the way forward and how they can take some steps into helping themselves um, as well. And I did um, also design my own oracle cards to sort of really help people. Nice. Okay. Oh, they, that's fantastic. I didn't see those. Um... Personal development. Right. Um, so you have your so, own oracle cards. Yeah, I was sort of doing a lot of work with the pet psychic side of it and then realised not only were people that had passed away from spirit connecting to me to pass messages on um, to the person having the reading, but I started using oracle cards, but I felt very drawn to making my own set so that they would be extremely accurate. So I did my own, which are called Live Your Best Life, mm -hmm. and I've made them really simple and really easy for anybody to use. And they're gorgeous photographs, actually, Shaw. And they're photographs of all places around the world where my children have actually been on their adventures. And they've been everywhere from Pakistan uh, to Italy, to France, um, to Switzerland, and of course, here in the UK. So my um, daughter, uh, my son's um, girlfriend, she's a very good photographer. So she's taken a lot of these beautiful photographs that we had made into an oracle deck. And this led me then to really get the bug for being a bit of an author. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. And then I decided to do a book teaching people how they can become a pet psychic as well, because I know that so many people are doing what I'm doing, but they don't realize it. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Are you still teaching at the College of Psychic Studies? I've done a course at the College of Psychic Studies to help people become a pet psychic. It was very successful. And I'm hoping to do more with them in the future. I, I really enjoyed it. For me, it's finding the time. <laughs> so I think as we go into next year, hopefully it'll be a little bit quieter and I can dedicate more time to provide in some courses with them wonderful you know i found this quote um about pets it's from a guy called james harriet i don't know who he is i must admit yes he says um if having a soul means being able to feel love and loyalty and gratitude then animals are better off than humans oh and that's beautiful a, yeah a soul and gratitude and love and that is precisely what our animals, our little pet friends, uh, I wanted to say supply. I guess they do supply it, but they give it. I want to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do believe that as, as a, a lot of people do say this, that animals teach us unconditional love. And I think that's really true. But I also believe that our animals are here to educate us and to really heal us at the same time. So I think it goes very deep. And I believe all animals have souls too. And that once we pass away, we all go to the same place and we meet back up with those animals that we have lost. And I think sometimes animals come to us when we're not always expecting it. So there can be synchronicity involved, you know. So a cat often will turn up when you're in your darkest hour, a stray cat. I have heard so many stories about people saying to me that they're grieving for a person or another animal and a stray cat has suddenly appeared in their garden and, and sort of befriended them. 
And sometimes you can just be somewhere where somebody tells you about an animal that needs a home and you feel that it's right for you to step in. So I believe that you always meet those animals that you're meant to spend time with. And I think they share so much of themselves with us. And at times, I think it's interesting to watch their behaviour and the way they act, because they can sometimes mirror what's going on in our lives. And so we have we have a bit of a joke about it sometimes. We say that dogs are like their owners, don't we? You know, and uh, you get a nervous owner, you might get a nervous dog. For, in, for instance. So I always find that to go even deeper where those concerns are and also the similarities to your background, for instance. So maybe as an example, you've got a dog that was abandoned and maybe at some point in your life you felt abandoned or rejected by somebody. So instantly you've got that empathy between the two of you and when you sort of talk about it it seems so obvious but you don't always realize that those sort of things are going on until you start to really analyze it so I'm always looking out for those signs with people and their pets those similarities whether it's on a basis of emotion or whether it's because they're going through a stressful time or some things happen to them And when this really came um, strongly for me is when I was training um, to be a counsellor, I trained up to level three counselling. And and part of that level three course was to go and study uh, at some some kind of counselling, you know, to actually physically go and study different types. And you could choose and research on the course what you wanted to do. So I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could go and study equine assisted therapy where people are being counselled through horses? Now, when I started looking into it and I lived in a place called Stourbridge in the West Midlands at the time, when I sort of Googled it, I realised that not many places actually did it. And you you would not believe it the one place that did it was less than five miles away from where I lived and I phoned the lady explained I was on a college course could I come and experience equine assisted therapy and um, she said yes that would be wonderful you can come you, you can you know make some notes and we can show you what happens you can even experience it for yourself And when she told me the address of the field and the yard where the horses were kept, it was a field that I used to rent uh, two years before when I got horses myself. So it was the most bizarre thing um, that took place. And when I actually got there, Shah, she'd got probably seven or eight horses and ponies in a field. And she said, to me now what we're going to do is work out the right one for you to work with and that horse or pony will make themselves known to you so I was thinking well how's that gonna happen and I made my way over to the fence and I kind of stood observing the, the horses and the and the ponies and all of a sudden something very strange happened two ponies started having a fight the one pony kicked the other one and the other one squealed and I looked at the girl who who was in charge and she just didn't react she never said anything and I thought her reaction would be to tell the naughty pony off that had kicked the other one but she just turned to me and she said Now, those ponies know that you're going through a big fight in your life or you're going through a disagreement with somebody and they're acting it out in front of you. And I was absolutely amazed. And I said to her, yes, I'm going through a very traumatic divorce. And that was a real eye opener for me, Shah, to actually witness that. And just as, as, as I said that to her, 
this large black horse made his way over to me. Now, I'm only small. I'm only five foot two. And this horse was about 17 hands high. And she said, look at the big black horse coming in towards you. She said, what are you going to do? Are you going to choose one of the ponies that had a fight? Or are you going to choose the big horse to work with? And I thought, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Because my um, natural sort of temptation was to go to the small pony because I'm small. And I thought that pony would be perhaps easier to control. But it seemed like the big black horse wanted to be my friend and wanted to come over and so I said Do you know what even though I feel that he's so big and powerful and makes me feel quite small he he's the one that's coming over to me so I'm going to work with him and she said the first thing you've got to do is put a halter on him and I thought well his head is really high up I don't know how I'm going to reach you know and she said you've got to work out how to do it and I'd had horses and ponies for years, but I just felt myself literally going to pieces and I could not work out how to put the halter on his head, even though it was something I'd done hundreds of times with, with horses and ponies in the past. And I immediately had this real emotion. I, I can't even explain it to you. Eventually, I got the halter on and, and uh, we led him out and we took him into another field and we started um, to work together. And there were certain tasks for me to do. And, and one of those tasks was to get him to follow me without me leading him, without having any kind of halter or rope on him. And then I've got to try and get him to jump over a little jump in the same way. And it really was allowing you to become very autonomous, enabling you to take back some power about how you're going to problem solve, how you're going to make this happen. And I just had this real emotion where I, really I felt like I wanted to burst into tears. But I wouldn't say it was an unhappy emotion. It was almost like a healing relief. And even though I'd been doing my pet psychic work for a long time, it made me really realise how much healing that animals can really bring to us, you know, and their purpose that they have within our lives. So it was a real eye opener um, for me that day. And I think that really helped me uh, work with people on an even deeper level with their animals um, and so it was just wonderful to have that precious experience and for me to witness it in a very first-hand kind of way because when you're doing readings for people you're the one that's giving the information you're not the one that's receiving it and that day I received so much you know that it will be a, an experience never to be forgotten that is just incredible i i have to say i felt quite emotional uh <laughs> I could, because i could en envision the entire scene with the horse the big black horse running towards you or coming towards you uh, it's just and the and the two who weren't who were acting out that but, you know, it did remind me when I was studying for my exams, yes. uh, I developed um, restless feet or restless legs just for yes. that period. The, and my cat would come and sleep on my legs. It's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? Uh, and so I, but you know what, Beth, why do animals stare at us? I get this question. And as a medium, sometimes even on platform, mm -hmm. when you know, I was at a London Spiritualist Mission once and I was on platform giving readings. And I remember a, a, an animal came through and I said, the animal just is just staring at you. They, it just wants to stare. And the, the person said, I don't know why they used to stare at me all the time. And a lot of people <laughs> said, animals keep staring. Why do yes. they care so much? Well, <laughs> The, what I believe is when my animals stare at me, 
they're telepathically talking to me. And that's what they're doing when they stare at anybody. They can see into your mind. They can look at your past, your present, your future, and they can talk to you in a telepathic way. Now, animals can't speak English like we speak. I believe they've got their own language, but I think our brain understands their language, but our brain has to turn it into something that we can make sense of. And so therefore, it uses all of our senses. So we may hear a word, a phrase, we may have a vision of something within our mind, we may feel an emotion, we may feel a pain even, we may even get a taste or a smell, but this will all be within our mind. So it's very clairvoyant, very clairaudient, um, etc. Now, a lot of people can gain that information, but we can put blocks there because firstly, to think that an animal is telepathically talking to us sounds crazy, you know, so that's a block immediately. The second thing is when we love our animals so very much, we can put another block up that can be saying, what if they tell us something we don't want to hear? Like we're not looking after them properly or they don't like the food we're feeding them or they don't like us, <laughs> which is very unlikely, but we kind of, we present with that block. So when I'm teaching people how to communicate with their pets and it's a very easy process, which I've explained everything in my, my book, um, I call it my pact method which stands for psychic animal communication technique and it's all about going into a deep uh, meditation state in order to allow yourself access to that part of the mind where you can be receiving this information you can also in that state send information back to your pet now it's quite, it sounds complicated, but it truly isn't. And really, a lot of people are already doing this, but they're not processing it. So it's kind of teaching you a set of instructions to get started of how to do it. But it's a bit like driving a car. When you first start, you kind of feel a little bit overwhelmed. You've got to put your indicator on. You've got to take your handbrake off. You've got to look in your mirror you've got to make sure that you're doing everything right now when you drive your car when you've packed where you go you don't even think about what gear change you're doing or you know how to put your foot on the brake you just automatically do it so after a time the process becomes automatic so uh, I teach all that quite easily in in my book as I say and what I really impress upon people is the quickest way to learn is to practice because you're not emotionally attached to other people's pets. You're emotionally attached to your own. So that makes it a little bit harder. But when you practice with, with perhaps your friend's pet or you could even ask a few people if they could send you some photographs to have a try. And I've put pets in the book. So there's pets in there that you don't know that you can practice on in the book. And there are some answers at the back. So that makes it a little bit easier for when you've had a go. Um, it becomes a lot easier. And when I've taught a workshop, Shaw, people are amazed at the amount of information that they can pick up from somebody else's pet. So it's just an amazing thing. And so many more people now are becoming aware of it. And many more people are interested in it, which is which is wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. And that a lot of that's down to the work you're doing here. But, you know, I was just thinking, I wonder why it's not that easy for some people with mediumship. Because it kind of is. But when people sit in circle, they really struggle. You know, yes. I know people who've sat in circle for 20, 25 years. And I just wonder, either it's going to think. No. I think sometimes we put pressure, mm. an awful lot of pressure upon ourselves because 
the first thing, if you're in circle and you're you're experiencing something and you want to share that within the group, maybe you're bringing somebody through. A lot of people are frightened that they're going to get something wrong. Right. We really fear failure. Right. So if they were bringing somebody through and they said, oh, I've got somebody and I think her name's Jane and does anybody take this information? And if everybody says, no, we don't understand it, people are like, oh, no, well, I'm not going to do that again because I got it wrong and I'm too scared. And, and I think sometimes we have to get out of our own way and we have to find that courage to have the information and be brave enough to share the information. Because I know that spirit aren't wrong and I know that animals aren't wrong. They don't send us things that are wrong. But as a receiver of information, it can be quite difficult to suddenly think that means. For instance, um, I remember having a reading ago and the lady on the platform said to me, she said, you know somebody who's in prison, who's passed away. And I looked at her and I said, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I really wanted to say yes to this lady. And I just couldn't think of anybody that I knew that had been in prison. And she said, I know I'm definitely with you. And she said, and this person in prison, unfortunately, took his own life within prison. And I sat back and I thought, I honestly don't know. And I said to her, I'm really sorry. I don't know anybody that went to prison or lost their life. Uh, in prison you know in, in you know they they took their own life in prison I said I'm really sorry I can't take it and I felt terrible saying that I didn't understand it to her because she was adamant that this message was for me the other information she gave me made perfect sense and it wasn't until two days later that I realized who it was and it was somebody who I'd been to school with and I had read in the newspaper that they'd been to prison and they'd taken their own life. But it took me two days to remember that that was the case. And even to this day, I feel guilty because I felt like this person had come through to me from spirit and I'd kind of <laughs> sent them back. And I felt terrible. And, and But what it gave me was this assurance that sometimes we just, and I know it happens to every medium that often you'll give something that they don't understand and a day later the, the person will phone you up and go, I'm really sorry, I've just remembered exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. And if you ever listen to um, John Edward in America, he calls it psychic amnesia, okay. <laughs> where he can give somebody like their mom's name or their dad's name and they can't think at that point. So I think some of it you have to remember that people can't always think. And when you get a no, it can be very off-putting. And I think that sometimes can stem somebody's development like you've said about Shah. So I think that should be something that's discussed within a circle that, if you know you're right, you most likely are. Do you know what I mean? And to trust that information um, that, that comes through to you. Yeah, that's a very good point and very helpful. Uh, my teacher, a South African lady who's passed away now, but she always said, just trust it, trust it. And I've always, yes. said, I've always just trusted. Yeah. Good, good point, though. Um, Beth, have you had any very surprising? Experience. I mean, uh, some of the examples you've given already, but has anything ever frightened you in your work? Nothing has ever frightened me at all um, with anything that I've done, fortunately. I always say that it's the living that will hurt you, not the dead. <laughs> I completely <laughs> so, agree. <laughs> If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email us at inquire at theinquisitiverin.com. That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiverin.com. 
Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now, back to the show. Yes, okay. so nothing's ever frightened me. I've had things that have upset me. When I've been working with animals that have been abused, for mm. instance, but also when people have had a reading and then they tell me some abusive things that have happened to them in their life. And I don't find that easy to switch off. Mm-hmm. I know that you should leave your work at home, but I don't find it easy to do that. When you're a caring, empathetic person, mm-hmm. I worry about some people. And, and also, I've checked in with them the next day and said, how are you feeling today? Are you all right? Because I feel like also with mediumship, psychic work, pet psychic work, it does come with great responsibility, Absolutely. you know, and, and I think you've got a duty of care to somebody as well. So I don't take what I do lightly at all. Mm-hmm. And maybe I break rules in some way, Shar, I don't know, because some of the people that, that I have done readings for now are my friends and we've become very good friends because of giving readings to them. Now, what I try to do is do at least 20 readings a week for free on my radio show because I think it's important that people have the chance to have a reading, whether that's a psychic reading or a pet reading, just to sometimes look at things from a spiritual point of view or reveal or what their animal wants to say and therefore it doesn't prevent anybody whether they are a believer whether they are a a skeptic or whether they're just on the fence they can all then have a go yes that's so important especially now the past couple of years and with the economy so that is so important that you're offering uh that to people what I also like is that you were saying earlier you did a counseling course because we know that, you know, psychics are human beings, just like counselors, doctors are. But I have found throughout my life, just having readings sometimes, it is the delivery that counts. And some people, you may have psychics. Yes. Yes. But you may You're have so right, so right, Sean. Mm. And the way you deliver, I've had clients say to me, "Oh my God, this reading's so different from the one I had before." This person said this or that, and it's the delivery. People can go away feeling bereft. So having some counselling skills can help people. Um, I think so. I'm, I'm, I admire you for doing that. Well, the thing is, when I was giving readings and people were coming and there's a perception when you're psychic that you know everything about that person sat in front of you. And you really don't. You only know the information that is given spiritually. And so then they would often offload to me because I would point out that their reading was confidential and that nobody could overhear our conversation and so forth. And they would sometimes then tell me things uh, that were shocking or something awful that had happened to them. And obviously a lot of people are grieving when they have a reading because they want to contact a person that has passed away. And I take all that extremely seriously. And I wanted to be the best person I could be to help that individual so I realized that by getting some counseling um, training I could give them the best possible service that I could do and maybe refer them to where perhaps they could get even more professional help um, so to speak so it also taught me to listen really well because I'm a big talker so sometimes I need to shut up and just and just listen to other people but the biggest thing it taught me was a lot about who I am and um, self-awareness and I wasn't expecting that you know when I went into it but the more you know about who you are and the more you know about yourself Mm -hmm. the better you can help 
someone else by knowing your boundaries by knowing your limitations you can you know assist somebody even more so it was an incredible thing and um I did three counselling courses and the first one I did my sister signed me up for it because she'd done it and she said Beth you have got to do this so she sort of took matters into her own hand, hands and put my name down and I was a bit well I, you know I don't know whether I'm ready to do this or I've got time to, to do it and she said you're doing it I've put your name down so it was the best thing that anybody did for me you know it was it was fantastic and and also I've been through hardship at times in my life mainly to do with with personal relationships <laughs> And it helped me overcome the difficulties and to understand people's patterns of behaviour that I had attracted into my life. And, you know, sometimes when the penny drops and maybe you're learning about something in counselling and actually that situation is happening in your own home, that was a big, big eye-opener for me. And it, it changed my life because it well really it it gave me the light that I needed to see that I needed to get out of a marriage you know and it gave me that real assistance and courage that I needed to make that break um and so it it really was a life changer so I'd encourage anybody to either have counselling or if they feel that they would be cut out to be a counsellor for others to seek out a relevant, appropriate course of action where that is concerned. Yes, that's fantastic. Yeah, it, it's. I so much enjoy the work um, more than perhaps anything else I've ever done. I was in fashion before, but when I became a counsellor, that, and, you know, I think there were 40 of us or something that started the course, but after three years, there were only 12. And only, yes. yeah, only four of us actually went into practice. So it's one of yeah. the things where, as you say, you learn a lot about yourself. Not everyone's meant to be a counselor. Most people go into counseling, a counseling course because they need counseling. So, you know, or they do psychology because they, there's something that they're trying to figure out, which is wonderful. But to, to apply it in a one-to-one -one is very helpful. And psychically, I think it's very helpful. I just want to switch gears just a little bit, get a little bit philosophical, just to see your thoughts. If you could live in any decade, past or perhaps a future in the present or future, does anything stand out? Any decade stand out for you? Well, I was born in the late 60s, but my mom often talks about the 50s and 60s as being a wonderful time for music and I'm a huge music lover and so she said of course she was born just after the war my mom was and she said to grow up in those times as a teenager was incredible and I think that even though I was born late I was born in 1969 so obviously I can't remember the 60s at all I can't remember that but it does sound like a period of time which was um, a revelation in many ways. The music scene, you know, took off with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and, and those kind of things. So that sounds really good. But I don't know. I just think maybe we've had past lives and maybe I'm drawn to that for a certain reason. But as a teenager growing up in the 80s, um, again, that was a, a, a magical time of music and freedom and express yourself through your hair and your clothes and dyeing your hair pink and having it all shaved off at the sides and spiked up on top. You could be quite rebellious, you know. So I don't know whether I'd change really the, the, the way, you know, the era that I've grown up in. And when I think about the time we're in now, although it's been a hard time over the last few years for everybody with what we've all been through, it's an amazing time to be a menopausal woman. <laughs> that sounds really crazy because more and more people 
are open to what we're going through and opportunities seem to be bigger and brighter than ever. And I think, do you know what? I'm 53. I've done so much in the last few years that I could only dream of. You know, I've had all this exposure on TV and radio. I've met these amazing people and celebrities and all that kind of thing. And that has been something that I've been able to achieve in this time. And I think that this point in our lives, you can follow your dreams, you know, and you've got a really good chance of succeeding and and achieving them more than ever. Do you know what I mean? And um, we can now make these wonderful connections all over the world. There, There is no... Uh, there's nothing that stops us connecting to somebody in New Zealand at 10 o'clock at night. Do you know what I mean? There is nothing. So I think it's wonderful. But, but you know, I think the decade that sticks out, if I, if I wasn't alive, would be perhaps the 50s and, and the 60s, just from things I've seen on TV and, and what I've been told. I, I, I don't know if I'd want to go too far ahead into the future if everything turned into... Um, artificial intelligence and robots because I've only just about been able to master this Zoom call, Char, so I'm not very technical at all. I'm with you there 100%. But yes, the 50s, you know, you see these beautiful images, the clothing, those beautiful dresses that, you know, the housewives wore. Um, yes. and, you yeah. know, and the hair was all coiffed and, you know, the family was sat around the telly. And there may have been two stations or three, but everybody was together and people sat and ate meals. And yes, it's a huge, there's a huge difference culturally and socially for everyone. Yes, that's true. Absolutely true. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. I want to go back. I totally get that. Yes, your radio show, uh, Beth, is a Psychic Beth Spiritual Calling Show. And um, it's currently on Wednesday evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. If people want to get involved, what do they do? How do they, how do they participate? Well, you can listen on the website, PulseTalkRadio.com. You can ask Alexa to play Pulse Talk Radio. But if you want to get involved, all you have to do is send me an email to info at psychicbeth.co.uk and request a reading. That's all you have to do. Or you can follow me on Facebook, Psychic Beth, um, or Instagram as well. But it's really easy to get in touch and I give all the information out on the show, like the text number, if you want to join in and request a reading. As you can imagine, we do get tremendously busy every week, but we have the most amazing guests on their show. We have very well-known mediums, we have therapists, authors, psychics. We've just had such a wonderful array of people Tomorrow, we've got an author. Uh, Her name's Caroline, who writes about dragons, and she's got her own dragon oracle deck. We've got her on the show. Next week, we've got my good friend, medium Sarah May, who's an amazing medium. Uh, She's coming on to do readings. We have um, a lovely friend, uh, Adam Claxton, who does mental health for men. He comes on on a regular basis. And uh, Often every month I have um, Minty May, who's a, an amazing psychic tarot reader. He comes on and co-hosts with me once a month as well. So there's always somebody interesting that comes on every week. And, you know, these people, they give up their time and they do readings with me as well to help people so that we can get through so many requests we do a bit of psychic development as well and we play a little bit of spiritual music so you can have a bit of a chill out and our psychic development normally is something along the lines of what's in the box and you have to psychically tune in to see what's in there and if you get it right I always send you a gift through the post if you get the answer right so it really has become this amazing family where we have people who listen in every week but we always welcome in 
new people. Now, do you know what? That show has been going now for 12 years and it started um, on the bridge radio in Stourbridge, a local uh, radio station. And when I moved to Worcestershire, I started doing it on Pulse Talk Radio, which is an internet radio station, and it's just grown and grown. So very grateful to anybody who tunes in and gets involved. Yes, I mean, congratulations on that because it's fantastic. And also the fact that it's a free resource, it will be helping so many people, also people who wouldn't otherwise know how to approach a medium it's it can be daunting uh, for many yes. people to get their first psychic reading. They don't know who to go to, who to trust. So listening, I would I would think that listening to your radio show can give people an insight into what to expect, what could come up, what could happen, and it will relieve some of their fear, doubts, and uh, maybe they'll take the plunge. It's wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you. Well, I'm hoping they do join in because it's not scary. And some of the perception when you've never had a reading before can be a little bit fear, a bit of fear, like, what are they going to say to me? Are they going to tell me something bad's going to happen? You know, a lot of people have those. And then when they can just listen in and see what it's like, and we do have fun on the show, we do have a laugh and a joke as well, which I think is really important people then um, are more inclined to join in and, and get involved. It's fantastic. Yes. That's why I always ask uh, my the mediums that come on our show, has anything awful happened or has anything bad happened? And they usually say no. It's just <laughs> to give people some hope to say, look, it's not scary stuff, really. But if they hear another medium say that, it, it may help. Um, I've certainly had some interesting experiences, not really fearful, though. So um, I think we, we need to take that out of the whole mix. It's just how you view it. Um, OK, so we've come to the end. We just have one more thing to do. And I call it we put a fork in it. Far out random question with a cue. So I've got a little <laughs> book here. And these questions are really random. I'll just choose something here without looking. There we go. What is something you, oh gosh, this, this is something <laughs> come up for you. What is something you predict <laughs> will exist in 10 years, but that doesn't today? <laughs> oh my goodness. So ironic. That is a real, that is a real tough one. What do I predict in 10 years that doesn't exist today? Mm. Well, I did see on the TV something about an invisibility cloak. And I thought, you know what? Maybe something like that really will exist wow. in 10 years. Because anything really is possible with our, with our technology. Um, I'd love things to be invented where you don't require an iron. So if you could have clothes that never creased. Yeah, I think they tried that with polyester, which was yeah. not popular. <laughs> that would be a, a godsend, yeah. I would say, if you could do that. But what I really would like to predict in 10 years' time is that we don't have all this war, misery, um, distrust, that, you know, the world's a more peaceful, happier place to live. That's what I would really love to predict, you know, and if that could happen in 10 years' time, that would be absolutely amazing, wouldn't it? It really would. It would indeed. What a wonderful way to end such an amazing, very inspiring interview, Beth. Thank you Hello. so much. And I know our listeners will, will absolutely love hearing from you. So thank you. Is there anything else you want to add before we end? Well, I'd love to hear from people. So, you know, do get in touch with me. Or maybe if you feel that you've got something to offer as a guest on the radio show, I love new guests. And, Shaw, maybe you would be a guest on our show one day. I'd be happy to. All you have to do is ask, and I'm there <laughs> <laughs> anytime. Thank you. I would. Do you know what? And I just want to say a big thank you for allowing me to share 
this information to all of your viewers and listeners and, and thank you for inviting me on the show I've really loved meeting you and connecting with you you're a very beautiful lady thank you same same here thank you so much um and I know how busy you are so thank you but yes I am happy to come just say when thank you don't hesitate I will be. oh that would be wonderful I really appreciate it Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Peaches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, your body and your soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert practitioner, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations infused with highly suggestible hypnosis to rid yourself of anxiety, fear, stress, and negative thinking. These guided meditations can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your everyday life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy.